like love it if you share the video. Oh, now we're going to actually record, which is great. Um, and uh, you can share that with your friends or on social media. But I'm going to introduce our panel real quick, and then we'll get into it. So uh, we have with us Jamie Conway, who's a mathematician who lives in Maryland. And Jamie says that he married into Yiddish because he married a family of a Yiddish speaker. So he figured he had to learn the language and he got really, really into it. Um, he's worked on a bunch of Yiddish projects, including typesetting the Yiddish translation of Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. I assume there are multiple Harry Potter wordles as well. And, and then in, in just a, about a week earlier this year, uh, Jamie and his wife uh, created the Yiddish version of Wordle or a Yiddish version of Wordle, which has now become part of the forward and we call it uh, Verto. I think that's the right pronunciation. We also have with us Nessie Altaras, who is the creator of the Ladino Wordle. He's an editor at, I'm going to mispronounce all these words. I apologize in advance. He's an editor at Alva, Al, Avla Rimoz, which is a Turkish language online publication focused on Jewish affairs. He has a master's degree in political science from McGill, and he's joining us from Montreal. He writes in English, Turkish, and Ladino in a bunch of places and including El Amanas, Amanaser, I'm sorry, I'm probably mispronouncing that too, which is the world's last Ladino newspaper. Um, Nessie is from Istanbul. And as I said, he currently lives in Montreal and is joining us from there. And then we have Abra Kaplan, who until very recently was the director of marketing for a Sydney-based community organization called Shalom. And that's where she came up with uh, the idea for the Jewish Wordle. She's from New York, where she and she moved to Israel in 2011. She has a master's from Hebrew U, um, and she's worked in media as well as in Jewish communal organizations like Hadassah. And she just like five minutes ago returned um, to the U.S. She's living on Long Island and may may still be jet lagged from Sydney. I don't know, but welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Let's start with just doing a quick uh, round, a round where each of you tell us, like Pekitsor, uh, how you went from, oh, there's something called Wordle, this is fun to play, to, oh, I'm going to make my own one of each of the ones that you made. And why don't we start with Nessie? Sure. Um, so for me, the idea actually came from seeing the Yiddish version, because um, I thought, well, if if they can put out one with a Hebrew typeface so fast, Ladino that's now used in a Roman Latin script now, we could put one out pretty quickly if we could find a coder. So I just shouted it to the Twitter void and uh, someone I was following tagged the person who made the Turkish version, who was very happy to help uh, as long as we gave a word list. So within 24 hours, we created this game. Within 24 hours? Yeah, the next and was that when, when was that was that also like in January or when was yeah. that like the a week after or 10 days after the original one came out. Amazing. So let, let's dial back to Jamie then since apparently Yiddish led to Ladino. So Jamie, tell us a little bit about how uh, you went from playing Wordle a few times to inventing a, the Vertel. You know, it, you, everything in our house gets translated into Yiddish. Um, so there was really no question. You know, you played a couple of times. We're like, well, this was fun. Let's do it. Um, so it was just, you know, a, a, I'm not a very great coder myself. So I kind of made a, a mocked up version for, um, for my website. And then uh, when it became time to do something a little bit more serious, uh, you know, I joined forces with the, the other Yiddish portal who had a, a real coder on their team. Uh, and to, to get into the weeds of, you know, making it good. And how about you, Abra? Um, so it wasn't actually, I didn't actually come up with the idea. Um, I did the content. My boss alone um, had just started playing Wordle and it was kind of like a crazy in the office. And he sent a WhatsApp saying like, hey, we should make a Jewish Wordle. And I was like, that's a great idea. And I think we did it in probably, probably took a little bit longer than you, Nessie. It took about a week. Um, but we kind of um, pooled all of our word ideas between like everyone in the office and um, I wrote the definitions and yeah, we got a coder because none of us can do any of that, um, but it happened really quickly. 
So let's talk about the word list because I know, I mean, I, Jamie and I have spoken before a little bit about how Yiddish came together. So he'll, he'll but and Nessie mentioned that it was like coming up with the word list. So how do you do that? I mean, I think it's a different question for the Ladino and Yiddish than it is for the English, but let's start with again, Nessie and then, and then Jamie who have probably similar challenges, but maybe different processes. And then Abra seemed totally different to me, but go ahead, Nessie. Um, for me, I went to the, best resource I know for Ladino words generally, which is the Ladino Turkish dictionary. Uh, it's only one way right now, but this is the best dictionary in Ladino that I think exists today. Um, so I had, uh, another, I reached out to the people who write for El Amanasar in Ladino and asked if anyone wanted to help. And me and Kenan Kuzchili, another Ladino writer, split the dictionary A to K, L to Z, and just put in every five letter word, three letter word, pluralized in five, and anything that could have a five letter version into a list. Um, like just typing it into the computer. Yeah, yeah, from print to Excel. And how many, so how many words are in there? Um, around 1600, so it's not a huge list. Um, and there's definitely users who reach out to me every other day maybe with words that they think should be in or things that I notice. Uh, like Ladino, for example, uses the diminutive a lot, like the ko or ka, um, and none of those diminutive words are in there in the dictionary. So ijiko, uh, little boy, or ijika, little girl, very common words could easily be added. Uh, so the ne next round, we're definitely going to add more words like that. Great. Um, I want to come back to you, Nessie. I feel like I, I think I need a little bit of a primer of kind of Ladino's history and how many people are speaking it today. So maybe, maybe we'll come back to that after a second, but talk to us, uh, Jamie, about your, um, your, how do you, how you came up with your list and how long it is. So the, the word list we ended up coming up with is a little bit over 6,000, 6,000 words. Um, we started with um, a, a list uh, that was created by uh, Seth Uriely. Um, who, who worked on the uh, on an Yiddish OCR program um, for the Yiddish Book Center. And um, so, you know, we had to go through this, this list in full by hand and th throw out proper nouns and, you know, throw out words that we actually couldn't find in any dictionary, whether just because they weren't in any dictionary or they were uh, OCR errors. Um, and then uh, we went through the uh, English, the, the more recent English, Yiddish, and Yiddish English dictionaries, and um, and you know, output every five-letter word, and and went through them by hand. We we had, I think we had, we started with a word list of about uh, double the size, like twelve thousand, and then whittled it down to just over six thousand. And and what Nessie said, I think, is a little bit controversial about plurals and diminutives. I mean, I actually don't know. I, I feel like I'm constantly wondering whether plurals and other um, kinds of variations like that count in Wordle, in the English Wordle, the main English Wordle. Um, but did you, Jamie, and yours count use plurals and and like diminutives or whatever the right parallel would be? So for the the get the words that you're allowed to guess, yes. Anything that was a valid word, we we were fine accepting. Um, for the for the secret words, like the puzzle words that we you know the one everyday word, uh, we only wanted to give you base form, so an unconjugated a verb, an adjective in its base form, a singular noun, um, and diminutives only where it was like such a common word that it really had a life of its own. It sounds like Nessie, you're nodding along. It sounds like essentially that's your same philosophy. Yeah, with plurals, we accept all plurals, like including, for example, onzes, like elevens, is an acceptable guess. But um, obviously, that's not going to be the secret word of the day. Uh, we don't. We didn't pick any plurals to be the main word, but we did put in uh, feminine and masculine of all the adjectives, for example. And either one could be the word of the day, like kurto and kurta, short for masculine and feminine, exists in the word universe. And um, how, many, how many days of puzzles is there in the Ladino version? Right now, there's around 300. Um, but as we grow the word list, we could definitely- You're continuing to add. Okay, cool. All right, Abra. So first of all, you guys did this like mind-blowing thing, which is make it six letters. 
so that was like totally breaking every rule of Wordle, right? But you, and you can explain why you did that. But um, tell, tell me how you guys come up with your, like, I'm still trying to figure out what is a Jewish word. So talk to us about that. Yeah, so are we. So the, the definition, there is no definition of a Jewish word. I mean, we pulled from kind of so many different sources. So there's a, there are a lot of Yiddish words in there because there's a lot of Yiddish words in, in spoken Jewish English. We also use of Hebrew words, obviously, that are transliterated into English. We used um, names of holidays, names of popular foods, names of popular texts. Um, we used a lot of slang. We kind of wanted to use words that people would, would be using in like everyday kind of vernacular, like Jewish um, conversation. Um, we didn't want to limit it to anything that was like dogmatic. We wanted it to be very accessible also to a lot of different people at different levels of like Jewish knowledge, education, observance. So it actually started very organically. We literally came up with all of the words ourselves. We didn't search through a database, which maybe we should have. And I think like going forward, we are going to be working with the Jewish Lexicon Project to fill out our list because I'm a little, I don't actually want to say how many words we have. It's not a ton because literally we started with like, we kind of sourced the words from people that we know. My husband's a rabbi, so he was a good starting point for that. Um, he kind of like sent me the, uh, like, uh, like some ideas and then the, the team at Shalom kind of fleshed it out. So we literally wrote every single word that's on the list. We came up with it just from using it in our daily lives. And that's kind of why I think that it's resonated is because like, these are words that, that do get used um, that are familiar, that don't necessarily follow any kind of um, like rule or pattern. It could really be anything. So that makes it very challenging, especially also with the six letter aspect. And I can explain a little why we did that. Um, it's really simple. It's just that when you transliterate a Hebrew or a Yiddish word to English, a lot of times you come up with a lot more letters than there are in the original. So you'll have that S-C-H kind of uh, uh, prefix at the beginning of a word or that A-H or A-C-H at the end. And kind of when you didn't allow for that, there just wasn't really a lot of, as much room for creativity. Um, but it also did allow, or it does kind of demand a lot of like spe spelling irregularities. So it's not necessarily always consistent in terms of the kind, the, the uh, um, spelling and the, the tra like transliteration or the translation that we use. So I think that kind of, I mean, it, it can be very frustrating if you're not able to guess the word, but it can also make, make it kind of fun because there's like so many possibilities. Yeah, I mean, that's what I was going to bring up. We have a, a comment from someone, um, Claire Nirenberg from the audience. He said, you know, she found it really frustrating because a word like Lechayim was word of the day. And she doesn't think of it as one word because Lechayim um, to, to life. But um, also, I would say, you know, there's an apostrophe that's not expressed there as there was in today's judal. Um, not to mention, which I suppose somebody might spell Lechayim L C H A Y I M, although I would not. But anyway, or E C H. Like, yeah, right. So, like, do you get a lot of this feedback of people just based? I mean, it's funny because you, yeah, you've got a lot of like made up words or transliterations, which, right. and I guess Ladino, maybe there are also multiple translate transliterations. I'm not sure. But like, do you get a lot of this kind of feedback and complaints? Um, that I was a bit worried at the beginning that it was kind of too hard because of all of these different like variables that were very unpredictable. But all of our beta testers kind of really liked that it was challenging. Um, so we, we kind of decided to move forward. Uh, I'm not really sure if we get a lot of complaints. I'm not like on that side of things, but um, I think that it is it is definitely like one of the more challenging versions. But yeah. that yeah. yeah, but that it's like very rewarding, <laughs> I hope. So how how let's I think that the English Jewish the English wordle, the main English wordle, a couple, a few weeks ago when the New York Times bought it, I believe was was getting about 13 million hits a day. I assume none of yours are that big, but how, how many people are playing your versions? Um, why don't we, we get, can start with you, Abra? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so total visits, this, like these data, these stats were pulled a few days ago. So I think our total visits right now are at like 670,000, give or take a few hundred. Um, about every every day we get approximately like 15,500 hits. Um, That's huge. 
which is like, yeah, pretty sizable. I think the first week that we launched, the first day that we launched, we had like 24,000 and the first week was 100,000. I think it just kind of caught on very organically. How about you, Nessie? We're not near those numbers at all. Um, I think, well, like, and maybe this is a good time to also, I would love to hear the answer, but also maybe you talk a little bit about Ladino and its history and its, and its current usages. Um, I would say we get maybe a hundred people on a good day, but really a core of 50 or so people, really. It's, it's quite small. I think, well, be, going back to your bigger question, the speakership of the language is, uh, skews very old. Uh, so I think that has to do with it. The internet game maybe hasn't caught on and we're obviously pushing it on online platforms that a lot of native speakers are not following. Um, but I think the initial reception was much more and then people have fallen off a little. Um, Latino speakership today maybe is around 60 to 80,000 people. Uh, but there's definitely been a major revivification uh, since uh, the pandemic began because we're so dispersed that the speakers are people interested in this language. I think the popularity of online learning and online communication has like brought a new uh, wave of interest into Ladino. So now there's always different classes being offered, often for free. There's also sort of resources that are coming out right now. Um, so that's very exciting about the language. How did you personally become a Ladino expert and speaker? Um, well, I wouldn't call myself an expert, I uh, just uh, an enthusiast, I guess, but my family originally is Ladino speaking, but I didn't grow up with the language. I grew up speaking Turkish as my first language. Um, and I made my way back to Ladino, uh, having learned some modern Spanish and mostly reading the newspaper, uh, reading El Amanecer uh, with the dictionary, uh, asking my grandparents uh, when I couldn't find a word in the dictionary or couldn't understand a phrase. And mostly through reading, I arrived uh, at my current knowledge. Um, and with spelling, I think uh, people were discussing it with Yiddish. Um, Ladino was standardized in the 90s. Uh, so now people usually use one standardized way of spelling it in Latin script. Uh, and with Wordle, we kind of erred on the side of caution by including different possible spellings. But of course, some people, when the word of the day isn't spelled the way they spell it, are going to get annoyed. So I think a lot of people who are often very good at the language don't know about the, for example, the standardized transliteration having a DJ sound. Uh, so that's one sound, a, the, a ja sound. For example, the word jarro, meaning like a pitcher of water, a, a pitcher. Uh, that's not with a J, but a DJ. A, J, a J would appear in a different word, like mujer, woman. Um, so that spelling differences, I think, kind of trip some people up sometimes. Jamie, back to you about how many people are playing it. And how, I mean, just like Ladino, Yiddish, I mean, Yiddish is, I feel like the Yiddish Renaissance has been ongoing and repeated for multiple decades now, but we have seen a, a continued uh, growth and interest in Yiddish in all things Yiddish during the pandemic as well. So where does, where does Bertel fit into that? Um, so on your first question, um, I, I don't have like firm stats from, from the beginning, um, but I think uh, towards the end of January, we were getting like around a thousand visitors um, every day. Um, and it's, I think tailed you know, tail down, um, and I don't really know what the what the what the current numbers are. Um, so, um, you know, all right. I can. I was going to throw. Tell you guys are. You all talked a little bit about your how these games came up, but I'm interested in like, are you puzzle people, word game people? Are you game people? What, what what like why? What drew you to to this? thing. I mean, obviously you each have Jamie and Nessie very connected to stuff with Yiddish and Ladino and Abra was working for a Jewish communal organization. So looking for ways to build community. But I just wonder, A, your relationship to puzzles and games and B, why you think these puzzles or games, whatever you think they are, um, like how that connects to this, I, the, the, the things you're trying to promote, which is interest in Judaism or Jewish identity and, and these languages. Anyone can start. 
Um, well, I'm I'm a huge Scrabble fan, so I've definitely always been into word word games. Um, I love all word games, but huge huge Scrabble fan. Um, and I actually was kind of late to the Wordle Wordle uh, train because um, it was so popular. I was like, eh, I can't be that great, but it was actually that great. Um, I think for us, from a from a from an educational point of view or from a like communal point of view, it was really like a moment where we were like, oh, there's this amazing thing that millions of people all over the world are accessing. Like, let's make access for our community too. Um, and I'm yeah, I'm sure that's like that also kind of rings true for Jamie and Essie that it's just like, let's kind of jump in on this. Let's um, make it relevant for for our people. Yeah, um, I definitely have also been a fan of word games my whole life in all the languages, you know, in Turkish and in English, um, and now in Ladino. And I think immediately I thought, like, as soon as other people were trying to make non English versions in all different languages, I thought this is a great way to engage, as Brian said in the chat, who's a linguist in Ladino, the new learners of Ladino, especially, because it's a way for younger people, the people who are learning the language are younger to engage in, in a way that doesn't require a high level of proficiency at the beginning, if they know a hundred words they could play. And we purposefully picked for the days of the word, uh, more sim simpler words, words that pe more people are likely to know, just so it doesn't discourage the learner. So we definitely had an eye out for that. And what word games do you like, Nessie? Um, I definitely like regular crossword. Uh, I feel like, both in Turkish and, uh, you know, like the New York Times one in English. Um, I've definitely been a crossword person since I was a child. I'm also a crossword person. Um, and also the, the spelling bee, trying to do that all the time. The New York Times spelling bee. Right, I was um, thinking so about the spelling bee, sorry to interrupt you, Jamie, but like this whole thing with, like I spend, I mean, every day I'm pissed about some word that the New York Times spelling bee says is not in their word list, often a Jewish word, although sometimes very surprised when they have some Jewish word or by the spelling of it. Like I was quite surprised that Talit was a New York Times spelling bee word. But um, so, yeah, anyway, back to you. Um, so, you know, but you, puzzles you, are, you were not like a Scrabble person or a, an obsessive about word games, right? Not so much. Um, I like finite style games, right? Games where, you know, you have a, a defined like beginning and input, a beginning and end, and you can do them yourself, uh, which is not Scrabble so much. Um, and Scrabble's a bit too open for me. I like these kind of defined spaces to, to work in. But uh, so in terms of, you know, using this as a tool for, for Yiddish, um, you know, there's the obvious, language uh, use that goes into Wordle, but also um, the um, just, just the fact of doing something in your, you know, in minority languages is brings it into your life. You know, uh, uh, I'm a big fan of just doing your life in, well, for me, Yiddish, uh, whatever it happens to be. So playing games here in this case. So as long as you're doing something and you're not necessarily thinking actively about language acquisition, you will be learning. So this is just another example of that. It's a great point. And I, I think your point about um, the difference between Wordles and Scrabble, and I, actually New York Times Spelling Bee, I think is the same, that finiteness of it. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to me that, you know, you're a mathematician. I think it is, it turns it, it's almost not a word game. It's basically a math game, right? To, to solve the finite possibilities. I mean, obviously using words, but I think it is quite different from like Boggle or Scrabble in that way. Um, Sarah, I wanted you to join us on screen because I, I'm i really interested in, as, as you know, in your linguistics um, and, and language expertise, kind of what you would say about uh, this, this big question, right? About how word games and puzzles sort of fit into language learning, language, language as part of culture. Um, and I guess then maybe I'll ask you, I was really intrigued to see that Ibn Ezra um, illustration in the, in the slide that looks a lot like Wordle, the, the, the first crossword. So maybe you can um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, 
from your zoomed out perspective as the expert, like how does this fit into the whole language history? Yeah, well, certainly language pedagogy includes a lot of games because it's engaging and it's a way of bringing the learner into the uh, language learning in a different way than just speaking or writing um, and making it fun. So it, it, it is a great way to, to learn these languages. And if anyone is interested in learning Yiddish or Ladino, I, I recommend those versions. And of course, Joodle helps with uh, the Yiddish and Hebrew words that are used within, within Jewish English. So, and are you a, a puzzle and word game person? And which ones were you pre-Wordle? What were your obsessions? Uh, not, not that much, but I have been doing a lot of Wordle lately. Uh, in, our, in our house, Bananagrams is a big deal, actually. So we, we do play a lot of Bananagrams. And uh, my youngest child started a Bananagrams club at their Jewish day school. Nice. Um, well, actually, I was going to ask you all to talk about what wordles or what 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 wordles you play besides your own, um, and or well, why don't we go around and everybody say that what wordles you like to play, and also like what your best guess is as to why this has become so popular so fast. I mean, it is really kind of ubiquitous. And the proliferation of games is also kind of incredible. So um, I'll stick with you, Sarah, if you'll tell us what other wordles you play and um, why you think it's so hot. Yeah, I play Wordle and Joodle most days and some days also Vertel and the Ladino Wordle and Midriyeket, one of the Hebrew Wordles. Uh, I haven't yet tried most of the other ones. I, I've dabbled in a few of the, the fun themed ones and Quartal I do um, a lot of days as well. And um, sometimes with family members, I'll do one of the custom Wordles too. Um, I think it's caught on because it's so um, simple. It's, so it's just one. If it was more than one, I don't think it would be as popular because people are excited to get that next puzzle. And um, I was actually thrilled today to learn that there is a Rama version of Wordle, and uh, which really fits in with my research. I wrote a book about uh, Hebrew use at Jewish summer camps. And so uh, that uh, I could even just find my spreadsheet with all the words I heard at Ramah and then help me cheat on that game. But um, <laughs> but I so I, I have a feeling I'm going to be doing the Ramah one every day as well. Um, but I think it's um, uh, interesting that the Jewish versions have become so popular in in Jewish communities. And I today I posted on Facebook asking for people's uh, feedback on the Jewish versions of Wordle that we'll be talking about today. And um, it seems that a lot of people are doing several of them. Uh, even people who really don't know Yiddish so well are doing the Yiddish version in order to, to help them learn. And um, Nessie, I'm, uh, now that I know there, there's only about 50 people a day, I'm going to really work hard to publicize the Ladino version. Um, so, so Sarah mentioned Quartal, which is one of my favorites, and it's where you use one guest to guess basically four puzzles at the same time. There's also Dwardal. Um, I, I wonder as, as we go around at whether um, other people have, um, my, my daughter showed me Worldal, which is, it actually shows you a map and then, which I find it does not work for me at all. I have no sense of what any country looks like in these outlines, or when I get these clues, the first time I did it, I was very close and still that did not help me at all. So that was bad. Um, and I, I totally agree with you, Sarah, about the one a day thing. Today, I was after I did court, I was trying to show a friend about it and I saw you could do a practice puzzle, which I guess means you could keep doing that. And I thought, oh, no, I do not want to go down that rabbit hole. So, uh, Jamie, I know this is like you've thought a lot about what, what what's your sense of, well, what wordles do you play and what's your sense of why it's so successful? Uh Besides Wordle and Vertel, um, I, I I've done the the Wordle that that map thing. Although I, I think I had the same issues. It just reminds me of how much I've forgotten since uh, grade school. Um, and there's this uh, Chinese um, aphorism, classical aphorism in uh, Pinyin, so written with English letters. I don't speak Chinese, but I think it's it just. I know like how the syllables are formed. So it's just been fun to just guess and guess and guess. And they put a new one out every 20 minutes. So it's uh, a little bit crazy. Um, 
I, I also, I, with Sarah, I, I think that the, the fact that it's, it's so, it, it fits into your kind of daily routine in such a nice way. It's, it's, you know, you wake up, do your wordle, do, you know, have your coffee and, and you're on and you're on with the rest of your day. And it's not take, it's not eating into your day at all. And so, and of course the, the shareability with little cute little boxes that doesn't hurt. Abra and then Nessie. Um, I'm kind of class with this. I, I think I usually, I only do Wordle, um, sometimes Joodle. Um, but it's funny because when I first started playing Wordle, I, the fact that it was only one a day was kind of a turnoff for me. because I like getting kind of like stuck into a game that I can play for a long time. Um, so I was like, that's only one. You can actually do the, the previous, you can, you can find the previous Wordles also. But, um, but I, I do agree. It's funny when we were in Australia, it only came out around 11 o'clock at night. So it was a, a late night thing for us. And my husband and I would just like, did you do the world yet? Did you do the world yet? Um, and it just became like a fun kind of bond, I guess, for everyone around the world who does the world. You know, you're all doing the same word. You're all like having a similar experience. So I think that's part of why it caught on. And also, you know, lockdown and quarantine and you know everybody kind of being in and on their phones and on the computer all the time it was like just the prime moment for a game like this to to catch on and nessie um so i do the ladina one the turkish one and the english one every day i tried to do the french one a for a while but i'm not there yet with the vocab i have i think especially with the spelling the map one I had to quit for a different reason because as a child who grew up looking at the atlas a lot, I know all the outlines already. So I was like, this too is easy. too easy. Get all of them on the first one. Uh, so I gave up on that one. I think the popularity in addition to the one a day and non-bingeability also has to do with how it like, connects people because it's just one answer. So you have to like, you respect other people. People don't say the word on Twitter. Um, and if there's a whole culture that came up around it, I think that's also, Nice that it's, we all do the, the same thing. And then after everyone sent it to the group chat, then you can discuss the word, uh, you know? So that's a little thing that I think is now part of our routines as well. Um, and I think it invites a lot of usership, even from people who are not necessarily interested in speaking the language as much. Like my mom doesn't speak Ladino every day or most days, but she does the wordle every day. So she engages with Ladino in that way every day. And it's interesting what you said, Nazi, I, I was wondering about this. So you, even though you made the puzzle, it's still fun for you to play it. You don't remember what the word was. Is that true for you too, Jamie? Can you play Bertel? It's like, an, okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a, a couple of weeks ago, we, we, we finalized the list of, you know, 600 words, no, no recollection. I mean, I also can't remember like what the wordle was yesterday. So I guess that <laughs> makes some sense, right? Or what I had for breakfast. All right, I'm gonna to turn to some of the questions um in the q a and i encourage you all to keep them coming um elaine durback asks a great one have any of you ever spoken or communicated with josh wordle the creator of the original wordle anyone did you guys write him, him to a, let him know you did your thing what I, I did i sent him an email um kind of right at the beginning i was because the the, the version i put together originally was using a lot of his code and looks and so I'm like, well, I should email you. And then, you know, well, of course, never got back to me, but I tried. I wouldn't necessarily say, of course, but okay. Nobody else? No. We, the person who made ours made the Turkish one. And then since then, he's made Turkish, Kurdish, and Ladino. And I think he's developing other versions of different minority languages in Turkey as well. So that's kind of spawned its own universe of wordles. I feel like there should be a convention of these Wordle makers and Josh Wardle should speak at it or actually his wife or who was it his girlfriend, his wife, who so romantic, this cute story. Well, there's um, also a great interview with Josh Wardle on Spectacular Vernacular, a podcast. So if, if anyone wants to hear him talk about the origin of the game, I recommend that. Can you say it again? Spectacular it, it, Vernacular? Yeah, a podcast called Spectacular Vernacular. Great. I understand too, he, you know, uh, despite all of his fame, he's like, I think he works at Reddit. And I believe he was like, yeah, I want to stay working at Reddit. I love my job. Um, 
not going to change his life too much. Um, so that's kind of cool. So another person in the audience, Diana Brement, sort of picks up on something that we we maybe went over too quickly. It's a good question. She says a competitive Scrabble player once told her that the game was more mathematical than linguistic. So that goes against what I said about Scrabble versus this. But anyway, I want he, she's wondering what you think, James, as Jamie, as a uh, mathematician, and does it apply to to Wordle? So in what way? Are these games kind of mathematical versus linguistic? And maybe Sarah would have a take on this too. For Scrabble, I think, you know, in theory, maybe it is mathematical, but in practice, you, there's no way, you, like, like, you know, game of chess, which is in theory, you know, completely a, a solved question. As, as a player, you can't sit there and do that, any of that in your head. So it might as well just be another game. Um, you know, there, there have been lots of, people who have gone on to solve Wordle, meaning, you know, mathematically determine which is the best starting word, what are the best guesses to make, and so on. Um, and that's a, a nice way of, you know, another way of approaching these kind of games, of trying to, to, to complete them, to finish them in a mathematical sense. Yeah, and linguistics does have a lot of mathematics in it. Um, one of the things that I do is try to start with a word with only one vowel with four in, in regular Wordle with four consonants and one vowel, because if you get all the consonants, it's much easier to figure out what word it is. You can basically read without vowels, which actually relates to language change because languages change all the time. And one of the fastest things to change is vowels. And so, I mean, think about English with its different pronunciations of a ah versus ah, and we can still understand each other, right? But if we changed a lot of the consonants, it would be much harder to understand. Wait, each other. Okay, this is a little bit mind blowing, Sarah. I wanna slow down for a second because I think that most people, well, I, I mean, I do not know, but it feels to me like a popular thing is actually to guess words like early or things with quite a lot of vowels. Um, and I think the theory of that is you know, the words are quite likely to have an E or an A in it. They, we know they're going to have some vowel. So if we figure out the vowel first, but you're saying for the same reason, the opposite strategy makes more sense. Yes. So what are the, what are words with a lot of, um, a lot of uh, consonants in them that you start with? Oh, I like the word strum, even though a U is not a very common vowel to appear in the word, S, T, R, and M are pretty common. I mean, I actually looked at the frequencies of various letters and E is the most frequent letter, but you don't wanna just look at the frequencies of letters. You wanna look at the frequencies of letters for word games because um, per word rather than per uh, the, the whole language, because T, H, E, and a appear a lot in languages. So the letter E and the letter A will appear more frequently in the language in general than in the list of words. So anyway, there, there are a lot of things to start with. Um, and I kind of vary it. For a while, I was starting with bagel. Um, yeah, I like bagel as a starting word. And what I, I also do, I usually start Quartal with whatever the Wordle was. You'd like the winning word of Wordle. That's my little thing. Um, and one day it was the it was one of the words, which felt exciting. Um, so Shira Rosenblum is asking Rosenblum, excuse me, is asking uh, if anyone knows what differentiates the different Hebrew versions. Does anyone? I do not know. I have never. I it's very. I'm learning from Nessie and and Jamie. I was thinking I didn't know enough Hebrew to play the Hebrew. My Hebrew is pretty good, but I was thinking I didn't know enough, and because I don't. I always get confused by cognates and typos. So, but you're saying it actually is good for a beginner. So I'm going to try Hebrew after that. But um, does anybody, does anyone play the Hebrew enough to know anything about them? No, sorry, Shira, we cannot help you with this. Um, all right, Avi Gold has what he describes as a theoretical question. How many words would be needed in the word bank minimally to launch a version in a new language? He is supposing, for example, one wanted to launch in Yavanic, which is Judeo-Greek. So uh, I think that's a Jamie Nessie question. Well, I think if we can start one with less than 17,000, uh, uh, sorry, 1,700, I think even a 1,000 would do it. Um, yeah. You're agreeing, um, Jamie? I mean, there's no real rule here, right? Um, and then, uh, Abra, Julie Stone is saying- Wait, Abra wants to answer that last one, I think. 
Oh, sorry. Go ahead, I Abra. Say, I won't reveal how many words we had in our original word bank, but it was considerably less than 1,700. I think you need, you know, maybe you could do it with a few hundred or, or less. You could do it. You don't need that many. You just need enough for a few months, and then you can keep adding to the bank. Well, as the um, answer words, but you, you do need a lot more as the possible guessing words because you need, people need to be able to eliminate letters. And that's why Joodle is so much easier once you find out that you don't actually need a Jewish word as each guess. That's right. it's always going to be a Jewish word for the answer, but you can use regular English words as your guess. Exactly. We needed that bank to be bigger. And so you put all you had to put all of those words into your like dictionary or whatever, right, Abra? The guess words? Yeah. No, we 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 basically made it so that you can guess any valid six letter word. Right. Um, Don't those have to be put into the game in some way? Um yeah, I guess there's a bank, but okay. um, yeah. Um, so I am putting into the chat um, a column I wrote about the Yiddish uh, version of Vertical because it addresses a, some questions that people are asking about Jamie's decision um, about how to deal with things like the double Yud and also how to deal with the different vowel sounds. Um, Jamie, you want to give us a, a the, the quick primer on how you made your decisions, and I don't know if it applies similarly to, to, to Ladino, but you had to make some decisions about how to make the game work for different keyboards, right? Whether to have the more expansive version of the Yiddish keyboard or the or the smaller one. So, so, so there are several different ways to, there's two different main ways to spell Yiddish, one mainly in use among Hasidim and one mainly in use uh, um, among the more secular oriented side of things. Um, the latter is, is where, where I find myself. So that's the spelling I used. But then um, in that spelling, there are some 40 different characters, um, seven of which are like contextual variants, just depending on you know where in the word they fall, like a mem and a, the beginning or the middle or the end of a word. Um, but even getting rid of those, you're like 33, 35 word, uh, letters. And the original uh, Yiddish wordles the vertels that I created and, and that the other the group created um, uh, had all those letters in it. And it was difficult because with only six guesses, you, you have to eliminate a lot of different letters. So for, for the for the version we made for, for the forward, uh, we ended up stripping all of these uh, Yiddish specific differences down into just the 22 letter Hebrew alphabet, you know, ignoring the, the final letters. And so things that were be written as a, a double vav in Yiddish, we wrote as vav, vav over two boxes. Double yud would be yud, yud in two different boxes, just to cut down the keyboard so that you, you could actually eliminate things in a sufficient time. Great, Sarah, I think you have a question. Yes, I have a question for the panelists. Um, I'm wondering for, in each of your versions, who is left out? That is, um, when you had to make some decisions initially, right? And um, Nessie, I guess your um, version of Ladino that is included in, in your Ladino Wordle is um, Turkish Ladino. We, are there other types of Ladino that are that are, are then left out? And Jamie, did, I guess you chose standard Yiddish rather than Hasidic orthography. And um, Abra, in Judel, do, did, did you um, have to, um, make decisions about which words you said you wanted to include words that were that would be known by many many people so you didn't include ones that were specific to orthodox jews and i assume perhaps um, not uh, including a lot of ladino or judeo arabic words that would be common in some varieties of jewish english but not in more common Jewish English in Australia or the United States. And, you know, some people have talked about Judel as Ashkenormative. And so I guess I wanted you all to address that question of, of who is privileged and who is left out. Great one. Why don't we start with Abra since somebody also asked the Ashkenormative question in the chat. Um, how, how did you deal with everything Sarah just said and, and kind of how concerned were you that that it would be exclusive or, or weighted toward a particular community? No, that's a great question. Um, it just ha it happens that our organization and our community is, you know, very um, Ashkenazi. 
So these were these are like this is the team that we that built that built Joodle. It's definitely not an exhaustive list at all, and we absolutely could use a lot, you know, more more diversification there. Um, and people actually send us kind of uh, submissions all the time of different words that get added. Um, there's so much. The thing is that Jewish English is kind of such a a large body that that is very that really resists definition and. Um, I, I doubt that any one person or any one group of people could ever know all of the words that get used regularly in Jewish communities and Jewish um, conversations um, because of the diversity of, of Jewish communities. Um, is there a place if somebody wants to suggest words to be added to Joodle, is there an, an email address or something where they can send? Um, yeah, they could, yes. So you can go to our website um, and you can contact uh, our, our director, Alon Melser. But um, yeah, something that we have talked about is just creating like a form, a very easily accessible form that you can literally just, you know, submit your, your Joodle word, which is something that, yeah, I think that we're, we're hoping Great. to do. If you can, um, while, while Jamie and Nessie are answering Sarah's question, if you can put in the chat their website so people know how to do that, that'd be awesome. Who is left out? Who's left out? And how do you deal with that? Um, for us, I think, a kind of defend Perahia's dictionary, I guess. It's not just Turkish Ladino, it's definitely more expensive, especially because a lot of the earlier dictionaries are Salonika based. Uh, so this dictionary pulls from them as well. Uh, and it includes words that are like more Balkan specific that wouldn't be used in Istanbul, like Pazvant, which is a Serb or Croatian love word for a knight guardsman. Uh, so like stuff like that, I think this dictionary is more expensive than just the Istanbul speakers or Izmir speakers. Um, but there's definitely more that could be in it. I think it's less location-based than more. This is just one dictionary. And still, we don't have a good English Ladino, Ladino English dictionary. Um, so that's a major uh, hassle with work, with work like this. Um, so the person who helped me uh, input this had to also be a Turkish and Ladino speaker uh, and not just a Ladino speaker with any other first language. Besides, so you know, the, the spelling issue does uh, in, in Yiddish does uh, exclude um, uh, Hasidic speakers. Although at least those who are um, online uh, tend to be at least familiar with the with the other spelling conventions. Um, there are I think two big like word choice issues that that came up. Like one is that um, you know Yiddish being spoken across a, a broad sector of Eastern Europe meant that in, in one location, uh, they would use a word which in another location, they would say, oh, that's just Russian, not Yiddish. Or in you know, another place, they would use a Polish word that have been naturally brought into their Yiddish, but then somewhere else they would say, oh, that's, that's not Yiddish, that's, that's Polish. Um, so you know, what is Yiddish is not agreed upon. Um, and then, in uh, what did came up is even after this, the spelling convention issues that I got uh, comments um, when I used uh, a Hebrew origin word as the secret word that that uh, some Hasidim apparently don't consider that Yiddish. They consider, you know, when they, they do use uh, Hebrew origin words in their Yiddish speaking, but they maybe consider it code switching. Whereas I would consider that uh, a naturalized Yiddish word. Uh, so there's, you know, disagreements as to what constitutes Yiddish, what is a, you know, a valid Yiddish word and not a Polish word, a Russian word, or even just a Hebrew word used in Yiddish. Um, and so, you know, you have to exclude someone when you make decisions all the time. Yeah, we, have had that, we have had that exact issue in the Ladina word with people giving feedback the other day, like two, a couple of days ago, the secret word was Havra. Uh, which is the Turkish popular word for synagogue. And it's actually Hebrew origin entering into Turkish and then re-entering into Ladino, not in a popular way. It's maybe the fifth most popular way to say synagogue in Ladino. Um, and a lot of people were like, that's not Ladino, that's just Turkish. But the dictionary has it, people use it, and the speakers seem to know it. So uh, that's all they need, I think, uh, to say that's a word in Ladino. Um, about the script question, I'd also like to add, uh, people have suggested, Ladino enthusiasts, maybe having a Rashi script version, which is the version of Hebrew script that Ladino used to be, uh, be written in. 
like with the level of participation now, I think that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, but if someone were to work on that, I think that would give a new life to people who want to use Rashi script and kind of use that as a learning tool for people to be accessing older texts because all the newspapers, all the books we have from pre-1940 are in Rashi script. Sarah, I'm, I, I'm really glad you asked that question. And I, now I wanna sort of ask you to address it a little bit, uh, not so much about this, these games in particular, but as, as an expert on um, diaspora Jewish languages, I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how language has either helped to unite our diverse communities or to keep them divided and fracture them and and keep and leave people out. I mean, it seems like this question, I, I, I where to talk about where the what you know about where the where your question comes from based on what you know about things that having nothing to do with puzzles, right? Like this is a this is a big issue. Right. How does, so how does language affect uh, our understanding of our diversity or our unitedness or fracturedness? Yeah, well, I'm really glad, uh, Abra, that you said before that uh, there's Jewish English. You didn't use this term, but I think of it as an umbrella term for uh, many different ways of speaking English with words from Hebrew, from Yiddish, from Ladino, from Persian, from Russian, depending on where people are from, right? And um, and also in um, Australia and in New Zealand and in South Africa and in England, it's, it's going to be different in different places. Um, in fact, there's a, a term called cement mixer, which means non-Jewish woman in England. Why? Because it's a cockney rhyming slang for shiksa. Shiksa cement mixa. It works in the British accent. Um, but um, and, and you know, and and yuk is another one like that, like goy, but it's uh, backwards. Um, goy becomes uh, well, goy becomes yog and then becomes yuk because of the devoicing at the end of the word. Anyway, so my point is there's all different Jewish Englishes, right? And so any decision we make is is gonna leave some people out, but you can't just have all of Jewish English in the game because then people will get really frustrated because they won't understand it at all. So I understand and agree with the decision to, to make it the, the greatest common denominator, I guess you would call it, or uh, you know, to include as many people as possible. Um, Aubrey, you wanna say something to that and then I'll continue with answering Jody's question. Sure, I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's such a big, huge range and so many people that we want to include. So many people who have so many different levels of access to um, like Jewish words, whether that has to do with like your level of observance because there are some words that like Orthodox Jews are more likely to know or cultural observance or, you know, like engagement with um, Jewish foods or, you know, there's just, it's, it's impossible to include everyone. Um, we don't want to exclude anyone. Um, we did want to, it was, it was, for us, it was all about um, kind of opening a, a channel to using like a really exciting platform to um, speak to our community. Um, Abra, I'm gonna, um, there's a bunch of questions in the chat that I think all are in the same vein and all about judo. So I'm just gonna um, throw them out there and see what you can do with them. So one, Lori Morell wants to know, how do you allow for spelling of gutturals in judo? Lori Lax says, transliterations are a real problem as there's no real correct transliteration, especially for Yiddish. And she's upset that many Hebrew words are rejected. Hannah Pollock, the forward's brilliant and marvelous archivist says, She's asking, how do you treat dialect or locational variants like American Jewish versus Canadian Jewish versus Australian Jewish? Um, and Julie Stone appreciated your answer on six letter words and now wants to know, would you consider a seven letter word? She said she often thinks of so many ones that are longer than six. I have in mind Schmier, um, although I suppose you could spell it without the C and then it would be six. But so, can you give us, I mean, I think the answer is like, how much can you do at once? But what, what's the, what, what's your response to all of these different 
nitpicky questions about your game? Let's see. Well, I think we mostly wanted to use an Australian vernacular because that was the basis. That's where Shala was an Australian organization. As an American myself, I definitely tended to use American um, dialect. So it ended up being a combination of those things. But I think that in a lot of ways, Jewish English is kind of international. So that's kind of cool. Um, that a lot of words do kind of translate to different English speaking populations. Um, what were some of the other questions? Uh, Seven letters, gutturals. Yeah. So transliterations, of, it's hard. It's really hard. I mean, there's the thing is that there's kind of no, there's really no definitive transliterate, like, like I'm sure there are, I'm sure the linguists here can tell us that there, that there are, or that people have tried to create them. But Hebrew um, is a very difficult language to transliterate. Um, you're going to find a lot of different uh, streams, like kinds of ways of, of when, like for example, spelling Laka with an E or with an A. Like there's there's so much variation. We kind of just had to make decisions based on what we felt most people would guess, and a lot of that was intuitive and not necessarily intellectual. Um, for anyone um, upset about the lack of, of Hebrew words or lack of, of like diversity in the, in the word bank, we are actually, I'm currently working on adding about, I think, 600 more words. So that should really expand things um, and, and give a lot more options for guessing. Um, it's kind of like we, we did this. It was, it was um, like, like all of, probably like many of the Wordle versions, we, we had an idea and we executed it and it may, may not be perfect, but we wanted to kind of get it out in front of people. Um, I think for the most part, people do enjoy it and um, that it brings, that it brings it to people, I hope, more people than it uh, brings um, anger or, uh, <laughs> or um, complaints. Yeah, be careful what you um, wish for, exactly. Yeah, yeah right, and it just, really does, it, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Sarah. Um, it, it really does bring awareness to the fact that there is this thing called Jewish English, right? That Jews do speak English, but we speak it with lots of Hebrew words, lots of Yiddish words, and lots of distinctive English words. Uh, but there are a lot of English words in your, mm -hmm. in your list, right? Like uh, the other day, one of them was scrolls. And I was right. like, wow, what could Yiddish or Hebrew word could that be? Ah, oh, it's English. Um, <laughs> exactly. But yeah, but also the everything that you guys are doing is standardization, right? Because you had to make decisions about first, which alphabet to use, then which spelling system to use, then which words to use. And that's that's corpus building, as we say in macro sociolinguistics, that you're building the corpus of the language. But really for Jamie and Nessie, you're using dictionaries that already exist. Um, and Abra, I, I, I'm glad that you're gonna be using the um, Jewish English lexicon and we, we um, I run the Jewish English lexicon, which is a list of words from many languages, especially Hebrew and Yiddish that are used by Jews within English. And we had to make the decision about which spelling to use as the primary spelling. And we did that through Reb Google. <laughs> we, just, we just Googled um, all the different spellings and found out which was most common. And so that is the, the main spelling, but then we also list many alternative spellings in uh, at, so that people can find the word, and um, and I guess you you probably have some of that, Jamie and Nessie, in in yours, Nessie especially, like Iju versus Ija, like how do you deal with the dialectal variants of the O versus the U, and then the E versus the I? There there's so many interesting variants there. Nessie, I think you had your hand up also. Jump in on that exactly. I think. Even this dictionary and many Latino dictionaries out there have to contend with dialectical difference. For example, sometimes I read something and I try to look it up in the dictionary and it sends me to a different page on the dictionary to say, you, this, we're listing this under this letter, but we know you might look here. Uh, and of course, that's very difficult with standardizing like this. I think it's just too difficult to get around every O, U difference. So um the the game that i have and i think maybe this is some of the turkish bias also the turkey bias it's definitely o heavy and supposed to the u heavy um and, and um, nessie while we have you on screen here samuel crickler wants to know whether you include verbs he said he's done 12 puzzles and has not met a verb yet so 
uh, non-conjugated verbs in the ar, er, ir version, their unconjugated versions are there if they're five letters like pagar, to pay. But uh, we did not conjugate words to be five letters. So that's, I think, the next uh, big wave of letters and uh, words that are going to be added is going to be like conjugating every uh, verb that can be conjugated into five letters. Um, and that would definitely add like hundreds of words. Sarah, <laughs> Susan, that's great. Great comment, Susan Hellman. Um, Sarah, I, while we were talking about transliterations and spellings, I wonder if I can swerve a little bit while we have a linguistics expert here, because one of the things that um, we've been dealing with a lot over the last 10 days at the forward, and I imagine readers are a little bit wondering about, is the, the differences between Ukrainian and Russian spellings of words and the changing of these words. So we all know that like Kiev became, went from being K-I-E-V, Kiev, to being Kiev, K-Y-E-V, and pronounced a little bit differently two years ago as part of a Ukrainian uh, take back, right? Now we see uh, Volodymyr Zelensky spells both his first name and his last name differently than um, than the traditional Russian and has added the second Y to his last name. The New York Times has not accepted that. AP style has taken the second Y. We've taken the second Y. Now Babi Yar has become Babi Nyar. Anyway, so we are dealing with like, what should our style be? What's best for readers? What, what's fair? There's a lot of politics in these questions um, very much between Russia. And I don't know, I wonder if you've been watching these spelling um, uh, debates or evolutions and if you have any, any thoughts about how that, um, if you have any thoughts about that, that issue in relationship to Ukraine and Russia. I mean, again, you've, as you've been saying, Transliteration is a fuzzy game, right? You can spell things kind of any way you want and, and, and it always leans towards one point of view, but it feels very hot right now. Yeah, I don't have specific thoughts about the Russian-Ukrainian spelling issue, but you're absolutely right that it's all political. And it, no matter what language you're talking about, if you're talking about diversity within the language, you're, you're gonna have some political implication or some social implication and um, there's, you know, a famous uh, orientation toward language that you, when, when you use language, you're aligning yourself with some people and distinguishing yourself from others because you can't align yourself with everybody, right? And so any decision you make about spelling or about variance is, is necessarily political. And I'm also finding that with even the names of the languages. And I guess, Nessie, you probably um, hear this a lot um, in conversations about what to call the language. You know, you called it Ladino rather than Judeo-Spanish or Judesmo or Spanol or Spanolite. You know, there's so many ways that you could refer to it. And um, I, I'm, I'm getting that uh, question a lot in the Jewish Language Project's work on Jewish Iranian languages. We're, work, we're working to document endangered Iranian Jewish languages and just what to call the languages. Are they Judeo-Persian or Judeo-Median or Judeo-Kurdish or are they, and Jewish Neo-Aramaic, should that be Jewish Assyrian? And, and, and people from all different backgrounds have really strong opinions about this question. Um, and, and same with um, Jewish English, when we're talking about it, should it be called Yinglish or from speak or yeshivish and uh, Hasidic English and, and you know all, all these different variants and 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 any any title necessarily um, highlights one aspect of the language at the expense of another and also um, highlights one particular group of people at the expense of another. Oh my gosh, that, thank you for that answer. That was really helpful and gives us a lot more to think about. I do want to, I, we are really basically out of time and I'm going to, um, but I do have one more thing to ask you, Sarah, if you don't mind, which is if you can tell us anything more about the Ibn Ezra puzzle that you put on or, and, or about kind of the history of Jewish word puzzles. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to ask Hannah Pressman to speak briefly about that because she's the one who found that Ibn Ezra puzzle and created that Fantastic. fun fact. And then she'll be able to um, take us out of the event and, and great. And so Hannah Pressman, the director of education and engagement at the Jewish Language Project and the organizer of today's event. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you. So just uh, to the question about the Ibn Ezra, I um, I'm largely in charge of the Fun Fact series, and in preparation for this event, started googling around 
for information about the history of Jewish word puzzles as kind of some fun, hoping there was some fun fact out there. Um, and I came across that article that was published in the JTA, another great news source for Jewish news, um, back in 1924. And that person, this is almost a century ago, it was in the midst of the crossword puzzle craze, I guess had hit North America. And they were like, wow, you know, everyone's into crossword puzzles. Well, let me tell you, that a you know a Jewish philosopher from the golden age of Spain um, came up with this kind of acrostic thing, and they included that in their 1924 article um, that someone in the JTA I think surfaced around 2011 and was like, look what we were reporting on back in the you know the early 20th century. Um, so we love to first of all we love to historicize our own obsession with word puzzles and wordliness. You know we're the people of the book, um, but what's cool about that. Um, it's a five by five kind of cube of, of letters. It's a palindrome. So it, it, it's got clues to this question that Ibn Ezra was answering. It's also the same um, forwards and backwards, um, which I just love finding palindromes because my name is a palindrome. So just <laughs> word nerd all the way. But um, yeah, so I was just excited to find that archival thing. And that's something that I do as part of my work is to look through different archival sources um, in different languages, newspapers across time, and trying to just um, find nuggets of interesting information for you find folks to learn more about Jewish languages. So that's where that um, Ibn Ezra fact came from. But yeah, if you look at it, you'll see it's the same forwards and backwards. So he was a genius, <laughs> basically. <laughs> so, um, okay, uh, I guess now I will um, just give a couple minutes of closing remarks. And just, first of all, I wanna thank all of our panelists on behalf of the HUCJR Jewish Language Project, thank you so much uh, for joining us for today's conversation about Jewish Wordle. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for your great participation and uh, input and on the chat. Um, I wish us all prosperous puzzle attempts this coming week. A special thank you also to our co-sponsors, The Forward and Shalom Sydney for making this event possible. And in fact, The Forward, which is America's oldest and leading Jewish news organization, has a special subscription offer for anyone who registered for today's event. You can get six months of unlimited access to Jewish news, culture, and opinion for 75% off. Uh, you can claim your discount at forward.com slash partner offer. That's forward.com slash partner offer. And use the promo code WORDLE at checkout. I'd like to also quickly highlight the Jewish Language Project's upcoming event on Sunday, March 13th. That's one week from today, Judeo-Persian in the 20th Century New Research. This will be the final event in our very popular series focusing on languages of the Jews of Iran. The event starts at 10 a.m. Pacific, and please note that daylight savings time begins that day. Our amazing interdisciplinary panel will include Daniela Farah, Habib Borjian, Ibrahim Shafi'i, Alan Niku and Jacqueline Ruffy. For more details and registration for next Sunday's panel and all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at jewishlanguages.org slash events. While you're there, you can sign up for our mailing list and access many online exhibits, event videos, and resources like the Jewish English lexicon that Professor Benor mentioned. You can also check out our social media feeds for fun facts, content from partner organizations, buzzworthy language news, event reminders, and more. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we are committed to documenting and raising awareness of the linguistic diversity of Jewish communities around the globe. We believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and every speaker has something to teach. Our organization is currently raising funds specifically to help preserve Iranian Jewish languages. We are now about 30% of the way towards our goal of raising $12,000. That's the money required to record 20 speakers of these critically endangered languages and create resources such as videos, translations, and dictionaries that will be accessible to the public now and for future generations. If you'd like to support our efforts, please visit the Give Campus link that Professor Benor dropped into the chat. The fundraiser runs until the end of March and we greatly appreciate your support. Thank you again for joining us for today's program about Jewish Wordle. We hope to see you again soon. Stay safe and have a wonderful week.